Oh, my. <laughs> my name's Polly Pistol, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> By God's grace, in a program called Alcoholics Anonymous, I haven't had a drink since April the 11th of 1977, and for that, I am eternally grateful. I have a home group, and that's the West Connect Group in Jacksonville, Florida. We meet on Monday night at 7 o'clock, and if you're ever in Jacksonville, please give us a call. I have a sponsor. My sponsor has a sponsor, and I sponsor, and I am an active member in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, there's not even words for me to say about how honored I am to be here, how honored I am to be at this conference. And I know that lots of people have said a lot of things about the two of you, Darren and Jody. But uh, I've had a front row seat to watching you two work on this conference. And I want to embarrass you, and I know that it will. But what I want to tell you is, is how much work has gone into this conference. And uh, I'm just going to just give you a little synopsis. Darren has a huge job. They have two children, and he's been nonstop on this conference. Jody has a full-time job. She is going to the university, and she has two children. And they have given their hearts, and they have fulfilled all their other commitments. And it is amazing what the two of you have done for Australia. Thank you. Uh, I am so honored to be here, and I want to thank Doreen. I want to thank you so much for hosting James and I and what you've done. And uh, I'm so honored and to be here. And I just thank you so much for that opportunity, for taking care of James and I, and for just being the person that you are. Thank you so much. Um, I'm blessed that I get to uh, sponsor some people here in Australia, and uh, what I'm really blessed is that they're all here this weekend, and uh, that's, that's an amazing thing, because I understand what Katie was talking about when she was talking about she hadn't met you know, her sponsee for a long time, and I understand, I understand that. I've had that experience before. It's amazing, and it can be done. It can, it can honestly be done. You can do it long distance, and you can get the work done, so it's, uh, it's an amazing opportunity. It's a gift. It's a gift that we get to have, and, uh, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, the speakers... <laughs> Uh, I have had the opportunity of hearing all these speakers, and I've had the opportunity to know all these speakers. And uh, Bob, you did an amazing job, an amazing job on step one. So it's, uh, I love to hear, I love to hear you talk about your surrender into Alcoholics Anonymous. How many people in here are parents? Wow, it's about everybody's a parent. And have you ever watched your kid do something really wonderful? And you're just sitting there and you're just so proud you can hardly stand it? That's the way I feel right now after I heard my son do a talk on the third step. I am so proud of the man you are, son. I am so proud of who you are. And I'm so glad that this program has worked in your life the way it has. And I'm so glad that you're such an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I also am a big fan of Chuck Chamberlain. And I also was a huge, huge fan of Sandy Beach.
And both of these people said something, uh, the same thing in a little different way. And it's kind of where step six is for me. And Chuck Chamberlain said that everybody's doing the best they can. If they knew better, they do better. Sandy said it with a slightly different twist that I loved. And Sandy said, everybody's doing the best they can with the enlightenment that they have. And that is what step six is to me. This is the step that says that I'm willing for God to remove these character defects. I'm willing. But then it lets me know I cannot do it myself. I cannot remove my character defects. Now, one of the things that I truly believe is that God is powerful enough to just come down and go woo and make me, as the book says, just as white as the driven snow. I, or well, the 12 and 12 says that. It's white as the driven snow. And I believe that God can do that. I just don't believe that's how he works. So it is my experience that what happens with me, with character defects, is I get the opportunity to have this character defect so that I can learn from it and work through this character defect and learn whatever lesson it is that I need to learn in life through this character defect. Now, that's the way that I feel like that God works. When I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I had a lot of glaring character defects. I had so probably one of the biggest character defects I had, and as of God's child, I should never have had that character defect, or should, 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 we can shut ourselves to death, was the character defect of shame. I was so ashamed. I was ashamed. The facts of my life when I came to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous was that you looked at this beautiful man that stood here today. In fact, somebody came up to me and said, oh, my God, how, what a wonderful job you've done with him. And I said, you should have seen him when I had him. <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous did that job. I had nothing to do with that job. Nothing. But the facts of my life, when I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I could not stop drinking because I was so guilt-ridden. I was so full of guilt and shame. And the biggest pr guilt that I had is that I am a Dr. Jekyll and, Mix, and Mr. Hyde that you read in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And when I take a drink of alcohol, I become someone else. And what happens is, is I had these two little boys. And make no mistake, I loved these children. I loved these two little boys. I loved them with all my heart. But I would take a drink of alcohol, and I would change, and I would be mean, and I would scream, and I would hit, and I would hurt the children, these little children in my life that God had given me to raise. And I was so grateful when I came to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I have been given great sponsors. And the first sponsor I had was a man who had gotten sober in Long Beach, and he had been a Monsignor priest, and he was a chaplain in the Navy. And through him, he was sponsored by a man that most of Australia knew as Frank came to Australia. Frank Honeycutt, time and time again, Frank Honeycutt would come to Australia. And he was sponsored by Frank. And a few years later, Dave and I had the opportunity, when we, after we married, to move to California. And I got the opportunity to be just walk behind Frank Honeycutt 
for 25 years, and I will for it be ever grateful that I had that man in my life. And it just, I told Bob last night, I said, anytime I hear somebody repeat the things that Frank used to say, he was just the most humble man I have ever known. He was so humble. And he gave us he gave us all of those gifts he went to a meeting every day like bob says sometimes twice a day and all he did was just help people and i was grateful to be in his footsteps and my first sponsor unbeknownst to me i didn't know frank then was a man that frank had sponsored that frank sponsored and what happened was, is I asked him to be my sponsor. And I think that God has such a sense of humor because I am a Southern Baptist. Now, you guys in Australia may not know what Southern Baptists are. But it's a very fundamental religion in the States. And, I mean, they'll get you scared to death of God. You know, them preachers are at the podium and they're saying things like, you're born a sinner. You're going to burn in hell. Uh, I mean, you think you, you know, and, and the Baptists are screaming, thou shalt not drink. And the other thing is, is the Baptists hate the Catholics. <laughs> now, I don't think the Catholics think a thing in the world about the Baptists. <laughs> but the, cat, the, the Baptists hate the Catholics. And when I was 18 years old, I was going to get to vote for John Kennedy. Oh, my God, was I in love with John Kennedy and Jackie. And I was going to vote for John Kennedy. You should have heard those preachers screaming at that con in the, every Sunday morning, you can't vote for John Kennedy because the Pope is going to run the world, the United States. And so here I was, and I meet this man, and he becomes my sponsor. And Frank laid a foundation in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous for me that I'll be forever grateful for. And Charlie was talking about Texas, born and raised in Texas, got sober in Texas. James got sober in Texas. That's where we did the deal, in Texas. And I'm here to tell you, you can take the girl out of Texas, but you cannot take the Texas out of the girl. That's it. Hook them horns. You betcha. Hook them horns. That is, I love it. I love that I got sober there. I got sober on the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And when I got ready to do my fifth step, I went to Frank. And I gave him my fifth step. And he looked at me, and he said to me, Polly, you are a child abuser. And you're going to have to go to those boys, and you're going to have to make amends. Well, you see, this is the thing that had, ate, had eaten me up my whole life, or my whole last part of my drinking and up before that, is because of what I had done to my sons. The facts of my life it was that I was the in charge of my children. Maybe 25 or 30 years ago, we were sitting around talking, and uh, somebody said something about being a single mom. And James says, well, my mom was a single mom. And I said, James, I was not a single mom. You had a dad. And he said, but mom, dad was never there. Because, you see, I was married to an Air Force bomber pilot. And what happened was, is he was gone, and he was gone for years at a time, and those children were in my care. And I was a person who could not take care of these children. I could not care for my children. And what happened was, is when I was sober, I knew what I had done to my sons. And sober, I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand who and what I was. And the only thing that would take away the pain of all of that was to take another drink. It was all I could do is just take another drink because I hated myself so bad for what I did to my kids and I would start the cycle all over again to what I would do to them. Now, the facts of my life when I came to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous was 
I knew I couldn't call myself a child abuser. Frank did that. I, I knew I had hurt my children, and I couldn't stand what I had done to them. The other was, is my husband was 100% disabled from the Air Force. And we don't know for sure, but it's pretty obvious that he was a victim of Agent Orange. And he was very sick, and he got congestive heart failure at the age of 36. And he was about 75% bedridden. And I could not be there for him. I couldn't be there. My father was dying of colon cancer in Abilene, Texas. And I was dying of the disease of alcoholism and harming all these people in my life, the most precious people in my life. And I was harming them. And my disease was making, I couldn't stop. I could not stop. I didn't know, I mean, I didn't even know. I didn't know another alcoholic. I didn't even know another alcoholic till, until I came to AA. Alcoholism is not in my family. It's not anything I knew anything about. I didn't know what was wrong with me. But when I did finally get some help, and I went to a detox center through some circumstances, my husband took me there. And I got there, and this was a detox center, and there were all these people in there. And we, you know, it's just like it was when <clears throat> back then, as it is now, if you go to detox or to treatment, you sit in group, and people talk about, you know, what happened to them and all of this kind of stuff. And they talk about these awful things that have happened to little boys and girls. None of those things had happened to me. Then I'd listen to these war stories, which I loved. My, you know, my jaw would be hanging down. I was so naive when I came here. Would just be hanging to the ground because these people were divorced. They'd been to jail. Some of them had been to prison. But what that did for an alcoholic like me is that set me up for the, one of the things about this disease that tells me I don't have this disease and sets me aside to be different from other, by other people. And I said, well, listen to them. I'm like People like me don't become alcoholic. Look where they come from. And what I do is I end up leaving that detox, have a little jitter house romance while I'm in there, and stay sober for 58 days, and then get brought back into that treatment center more dead than alive. And what happens is, is in the, I reach that, that point of desperation, but the desperation is like I'm fa I can see myself. I see who I am. I see the child abuser. I see the can't take care of your husband. I see all of those things. I can see. Now, you wouldn't, I would have never known that all that's character defects. I wasn't into the steps yet. I had no idea what all that was. All I knew was is I couldn't live with myself. And I love what Clancy says. He talks about what happens when we're sober. And I knew that what happened was, is I couldn't live with myself sober. You see, I didn't know those steps were going to take away all this pain. I just knew I couldn't live with the facts of my life. I couldn't live with it. And that's when James told you that story about me getting a bottle of scotch and a bottle of Valium and checking into a motel. I couldn't stand who and what I was. I couldn't stand that. And by God's grace, I had a husband who court committed me to treatment. And that court commitment, talk about having resentments and stuff. I had lunch about two or three months ago with a childhood friend that I had known. And she had known me before I got sober. And then she met me shortly after I got sober. And she said, and we hadn't seen each other since then. It's been like it's almost, I'm, I'll be sober 40 years next month. So it was, it's been like almost maybe 39, 38 years since I've seen her. And she said, oh, yes, I remember you were so mad at your husband for putting you in that treatment center. And so I was still complaining about having been court committed to that treatment center. 
So I hadn't even gotten over that resentment at a couple of years of sobriety. How dare him do that to me? He merely saved my life. He merely saved my life. And for that, I am so grateful. But see, that's the whole thing. That's about these character defects and how they just keep manifesting themselves around self. Here, self, 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 self. And what happens is, is that I didn't even get it. And here I am going to take my life because I can't stand to be sober. I'm going to take my life. I'm going to leave my husband. I'm going to leave my children because I don't see another way out than to absolutely get out because I don't see any hope. And the biggest thing that I have been able to grasp in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous since I've gotten here is that wonderful, wonderful gift of hope the hope that there is an answer here. And I'm like most everybody else. When I got, first got sober, I mean, I, sometimes I can't even believe that the people, I still have people that are just a few months less sobriety than me that I started sponsoring. I cannot believe those people are still alive having me sponsoring them <laughs> when I first got sober. I mean, it has to be a God deal because there's no way. I didn't know enough. I didn't have any idea. I didn't know anything. I mean, you know, now the way I take a woman through the book and all the stuff I do, these poor people, you know, we just kind of went to meetings and read the book. And, I mean, we weren't without the big book. That is, ob you know, obviously. But certainly I didn't know what I know today. I certainly did not know what I know today. And what I want to talk about is those character defects. There's a lot of those character defects that have been removed. And one of them is, is because I'm sober, because I'm sober today, I think I'm a pretty darn good mom. I'm a good grandma. And this program gave me that. I am so grateful for my sons. I'm so grateful for the forgiveness, the, the gift of forgiveness. I have been given this enormous gift of forgiveness. And uh, one of the things that I'm going to share, too, I was going to share it tomorrow, but I'll probably share it both times. James and I were doing a family afterwards in Tallahassee a little while ago, and, so, and I was talking about it, and I talk about it often, and that is, is that in the ninth step promises, the one that I don't get, I haven't really gotten, is that we will not regret the past, because there are a lot of things that I see that I regret the past. And uh, I had said that on Saturday night when I talked, and we did this thing on Sunday morning, much like we're going to do tomorrow morning. And James looked at me, and he said, after, on Sunday morning, he said, Mom, I am the man I am because of all of the things that have happened to me. And you just need to get over it. <laughs> and... Uh, I wish that were, you could just say that and wipe it away. That would, be, that would be great. But these are the things. You get the gift of forgiveness here. Amazing. We are, here we sit, people who have done so many things. And all I can tell you is, is that I am glad that the God of my understanding is merciful instead of just. Because if I got what I deserved, I certainly wouldn't be standing here with you people today. So what has happened is, is some of those character defects have been removed. Some of the, and really some of the glaring ones have been removed. But most of them just kind of take steady work. I'd love to tell you right now that I never tell a lie. I lie all the time. I might tell you, you look great in a dress, and in my head, I don't believe it. <laughs> I do that all the time. I'd love to tell you that I lie. I'd love to tell the truth all the time, but I don't. There, 
And one of the things that happens, I was in a, we were in a meeting Monday, or no, Thursday, and uh, at noon, and they were talking about that. The best we, you know, we learn through pain. And what happens is, is things that happen to us that cause pain are our greatest teachers. And I know that today, that, and I'm supposed to thank God for the pain. Thank God for the pain. And that was what the reading was, and Bill, as, as Bill sees it. And Bill talks about all spiritual pro- pain is the touchstone of all spiritual progress. That has been my experience. I would love to learn really deep stuff in other ways. <laughs> but it seems like that's the way I have to learn it, is through pain. Now, what I'm going to try to do, I didn't even see what time I started, so I'm, going to, I'm sure that I, it, I started at 12. So one of the things I'm going to talk about is some character defects that are today. Now, we all have manipulation, lying, all of the character defects that we, and I still have them all. I think what happens is, is that I've made some progress in all of it, and I don't do it all the time. I'm a bit, you know, I'm a much better person at it, but I still have character defects that really, really harm me, and probably one of the worst character defects that I have that causes me so much harm is fear, and I have been having a lot of experience in the last year and a half with the character defect of fear. Um, Last September, September a year ago, in fact, uh, uh, Robin and Leslie were visiting us there from Perth, and they were visiting us in Jacksonville, and Leslie's a nurse. And uh, Dave was getting ready to have a little back surgery It was very non-invasive, but it did require a mild anesthetic. And in doing that, they were going to do, they had to do a chest x-ray. It was just standard operation. That's what they were going to do is a chest x-ray. And uh, what happened was is they saw a spot on his lung. And then the next day, they did a CAT scan on him. And we went to the doctor, and we got this CAT scan report, and they set him up for a biopsy. But Leslie was there with us, and she said, I'm certain that that's cancer. And that, you know, but it looks like that it's encapsulated and it's going to be all right. And what happened was is Dave did have cancer, and he had lung cancer. And then he couldn't be operated on for the lung cancer because on the CAT scan they found a, uh, a clot in his heart. And they had to get rid of the, and it was just one thing after another that was going on. And uh, finally, we ended up being able to do the cancer surgery. And in the meantime, the cancer had grown twice as big, very fast, most lung cancer is, very fast growing. And I began to have a fear. And I remember being at Ladybug, and I I love this person named Mary Emma. And if I had, I had been there, and I had also said it to Sharon, because that he hadn't had surgery yet. It was in November. And I told Sharon, I don't want to be you. I don't want to be you. And he, because he was so sick, and I was scared. I was absolutely terrified. Because I didn't want to be you. I didn't want to be Barry Emma. And, uh, but, you know, this was serious stuff. And, oh. Uh, So I started this thing with fear. I just got so much fear. And I've kind of been, it's been better as the year, it's as a year and a half has gone. But Dave's 81 years old. And when you have, when they remove half your lung and when they give you chemotherapy and they do all those things, that's a pretty rough ride on an 80 year old man. And so it's been kind of tough. So let's get down to like about right now. And uh, about 10 days ago or two weeks, I can't remember, uh, my husband got up 
to go to the bathroom. And he was so weak, he couldn't do it. And I had to, I called a friend, Jim Powers, a friend. I mean, the, probably one of the finest men in AA you'll ever, ever meet. And I called him to come help me. What am I going to do? And uh, Jim was a EMT, had been an EMT. And so he knows all that stuff, has helped me through this whole thing. Jim's been there. And he said, we need to call an ambulance. You or I cannot get him down the stairs and into the car. We can't do it. And so here goes my husband to the hospital by ambulance because he's so weak he can't stand. And then I take him to the doctor on Monday, and she says, you know, uh, he's just really sick. He has a lung infection, which is pretty common when things like that have happened. And she even wrote me an excuse, a letter, that uh, there's no way you can go to Australia. And I'm just devastated because this is James and I were going to be together this was like a trip of a lifetime and I was just into that selfishness and self-centeredness and I mean look at what's happening to me I don't get to go to Australia and all of this and I had just finally surrendered which took a lot to surrender and I started emailing Jody and Darren that I don't think I'm going to be able to make it and uh, then, you know, when all else fails, I decide to call my sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can be 39 years sober and forget to do that. <laughs> and uh, those of you who know Rena know she is, I mean, she is so wise. Not only that, she's drop-dead gorgeous, and she's just... I mean, she's wonderful. And uh, so let me just tell you what sponsors do with character defects. And she said, uh, and I told her that, you know, I, I, and by now David's getting better, okay? He's getting better. This is now uh, a few days after all this, and he's starting to get better. And she says, uh, Polly, tell me what you're afraid of. And I said, I'm afraid something is going to happen to Dave, and I'll never forgive myself. Did everybody hear that? No. I will never forgive myself. Not that it had anything to do with him, but I wouldn't forgive myself. Selfish, self-centered. And she said the words... Her first words before she continued, she said, any decision based on fear is a poor decision. And she said, you were going to Australia. What provisions had you made for Dave? And I said, well, I had uh, called his sponsee, Jane, in Las Vegas, and asked her if she would come to Jacksonville and stay a week with Dave. And not only did she come, she was so delighted. She said, oh, my God, I get a week with Dave. She was so excited to come stay with him. And then Jim, who has a dog, Lucy, and instead of coming and checking, you know, on his dog or whatever, and my dog, he puts, he says, I'm putting Lucy in the kennel, and I'm moving in with Dave until you get home. These were the provisions that I had made to come to, to come here. And what happened was, is that she said, well, it sounds to me like you've made some pretty good provisions for Dave to go to Australia. She says, but I'm not hearing any element of God. Where's God in all this? Where's God? Is God, does God love Dave as much as he loves you? Is God going to take care of Dave while you're gone? And she says, something could happen to Dave and you could be at Costco. And it would be the same. And she says, in my opinion, I think you need to go to Australia. 
and let Dave and God, let God take care of Dave and all the people he has provided for you to care for him, and you trust that you are not the one that is keeping Dave alive. (laughs) Now I want to point out that character defect. It's called self-reliance. I had no idea how steeped I was in the character defect of self-reliance. That what I was doing is like I was praying for God to take care of Dave. I've been praying that ever since all this started. But I'm not sure I really was letting God take care of Dave. I thought I was doing it. I had gotten so involved with that that I had let God just go right out. I was giving it lip service, but I wasn't relying on God. What is amazing is, is that I am in Australia having a trip of a lifetime with my son. We haven't ever been able to do this. Not ever have we been able to do this. To be together for two weeks and do stuff together. We've never had this. And we're having a trip of a lifetime. And I would have passed that up. And then Rena, being such a smart sponsor, she knows my story really well. Plus, she knows my son really well. And she says, and can you, ama- can you imagine the amends that you're going to be able to make to your son in this two weeks? See, because I'm in self, and we've, the third step just sort of sets up everything. For the, it sets it up for the inventory, and definitely, when we talk about, there's only two paragraphs in the big book about character defects. But, you know, what it's saying is, it's just telling us that we cannot get rid of them. We have to surrender it to God. God is who removes the character defect. I have to surrender myself to God to have the character defect removed. My creator, I offer myself to you to take away, to take away the good and the bad. I offer myself to you. I have to have God remove these character defects. Self-reliance is what I had because I was so steeped in fear. I'm going to talk about two other character defects that are really mine besides the fear of self-reliance. And the other is being accountable, commitment, and justification, and I'm going to mold that all up together, okay? I was at a conference in uh, Lake Lanier a couple of years ago, and uh, somebody I love really a lot came to me, and he said, you ought to take a look at how you stay on the road all the time and leave your husband. And, you know, both of you are in the later years of your life. And this is a time that you should really be spending time together. And, you know, people don't come to you and tell you those kind of things unless they really love you, unless they really care about you. And he says, I'm concerned about you. You don't know how to say no. You're gone every weekend. I'm concerned about you. And uh, I just wish you would just think about it. And uh, so I started thinking about it. And so my son had come to me before that was told to me. And he says, you know, it's really painful to watch my mom kill herself. I've already been there. And he says, and it's just I don't like to watch it. And so I went to my son. And I told him what had happened. And I said, I want you to to keep my schedule. And I'm going to 
whenever I get asked to speak, I'm going to let you look at it and see if it's something I need to do and if it's reasonable and if it's not too much. And, uh, and I ask him to do this, okay? Well. <laughs> so we've got a problem here because uh, now I'm accepting things and I, for, I forget. I don't forget. I just do it without thinking or whatever. I don't know, but I will accept it. And uh, so he's really being rough. He is a tough sponsor. He's saying, you are not, you're either going to do this or you're not going to do this. You're either going to be accountable to me or you're not going to be accountable. Well, then what happens is uh, I get called on the carpet here while we're in Sydney. And Doreen's saying, the two of you stop fussing. <laughs> and James says, I need to talk to you about being accountable again. I get this call to speak at the Gulf Shore Roundup. And uh, I know that he's going to ask James too. So I say yes. And then he says, I need to talk about that to you. You did that without talking to me. I said, but he was going to ask you, and I knew if he asked you that you'd want to do it, and I want to do it with you, and blah, blah, blah. So now I'm justifying. <laughs> I'm making this huge justification of why I'm not being accountable. And what I have to look at is I do that all the time. I will make myself, I will justify something that I need to be held accountable for. Thank God we have sponsors. Thank God I have a son that's holding me accountable. And these are the things that I see. Now, the blatant character defects, like I'm not stealing. I never was a stealer of things. I would steal your heart and your feelings. But a lot of those kind of character <laughs> defects, yeah, not, not your money. I didn't steal your money. I thought when we got here that it was just they were talking about being a thief. And I wasn't a thief by stealing things. I forgot about, you know, I break your heart and steal your love and all of that. But what happened is, is a lot of those character defects, are, you know, are not so blatant. And, I mean, they'll sneak in, but they're not blatant anymore. God, I mean, those have been pretty much, I've been relieved. But some of these that are deep. One of the things I know, the longer I stay sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, those deep, dark crannies of the soul are really dark. There's some real darkness there. And this, this is something that, I mean, I can make... I, what I have learned about myself is I can justify making a wrong right. And that's the character defect of justification. I can make it okay. But I'm helping somebody. And James would, and people would say to me, then let you have, you sponsor a boatload of women. Pass the torch to them and let them do it. Oh, there's no ego connected to any of that. <laughs> but then look what I'd miss out on. So it just goes on and on and on. And what happens is, is what I'm learning is, is that there's a lot of subtleties to these character defects. And they will pop up and they will make me look like I'm so nice. And I'm such a good person, but I'm really not. What it is, is it's that thing that has been talked about this morning and last night that started off with Bob talking about the first step and Katie the second, James the third, and Charlie the fourth, and that's that selfishness, that self-centeredness we think is the root of our troubles, driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. 
we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. And I think all the time that I'm being such a good person. So these six and seven, there's two little paragraphs in the big book about six and seven. But they're powerful, powerful paragraphs because it talks about I have to be willing to surrender these character defects to God. And then I have to be willing to let him remove them. I am powerless. I am powerless. Step one, all the way back, I cannot manage my own life. I, my life is unmanageable. And when I get to six and seven, working through the steps, I see that my life is still unmanageable. My character defects are unmanageable. The other thing I want to talk about is uh, depression. And our, co our co-founder, Bill Wilson, suffered from depression. And do I think depression is a real illness? I do. But I'm going to talk about me and my depression. And one of the things that I want to talk about with depression is for me and depression is the highest form of self-centeredness. Because when I am depressed, the only person I think about is me. I am consumed of self. And what I'm grateful for is I had a sponsor when I first came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I want to say that I am grateful. I truly be I, I believe we need all three sides of the, of the triangle, all three. I am so grateful because I guarantee you the big book did not seduce me into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> what seduced me into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous was the fellowship. The fellowship was what did it. I fell in love with the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I fell in love with it with a passion that was absolutely un measurable to me. I love, I still have that passion today. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. And what happened is, is I'm a student of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we moved to Jacksonville, Florida. And I thought Jacksonville, Florida had pretty lame AA. And I had thought that when I moved to California and started doing uh, Alcoholics Anonymous in Bellingham. And then Don and Eileen moved there, and we put together a conference, and it got good. It got real good. And so I thought it was great. Then we moved to Jacksonville, and here we go again. Really lame. And I'm a student of the big book. I know the big, I, I love the big book. And it seems like every time I read it, I find something I missed. I didn't even see it there. But something was missing. And what was missing was the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what I have today in the, in the rooms in Jacksonville is we have a tribe. We have a tribe. And I love it because Judas run around here with a, with, a, with a sweatshirt on that says Road Dogs. And I can tell you right now, I, can, I, I believe that if I were isolated somewhere in Iceland or Greenland or somewhere, if I had the book of Alcoholics Anonymous and a good relationship with God, I'm going to stay sober. But I'm going to tell you, if I don't have the fellowship, it ain't near as much fun. <laughs> and what I love about the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is it's fun. And then the service, I got to be into service. And what happened for me is what Frank told me when I had, he said, okay, so you're depressed. I had, I mean, I'd been diagnosed manic depressed, all of these depressions. I had all kinds of tranquilizers and barbiturates and all these things in the military. They were trying to fix me good because I was depressed. And he says, I've got an antidote for pressed. depressed. You go help another alcoholic. And you throw your life into helping another alcoholic.
And I can tell you today, one of the greatest gifts that I have is being able to work with other women in this program. It is absolutely the greatest gift that the program of Alcoholics Anonymous has given me is being able to work with another woman. Nothing Nothing will light my fire like sitting down and reading this book with another woman and watching the lights come on. And Bill talks about that in the language of the heart, in the thing that he talks about, our next frontier, emotional sobriety. Nothing will light our fire or what Bob says, turn the juice on like watching somebody's lights come on and see somebody begin to recover. One of the things that I truly believe is that everything we have, whether it's a character defect, whatever happens, God uses it. There are no negatives in God's world. And there was a guy that I had the privilege of knowing by the name of Dr. Paul. And he used to say, there are no negatives in God's world. Everything, all of those character defects, eventually work for the good. Because what happens, if nothing else, is I just get to tell on myself and let you know I have it. So if you have that character defect, you can tell on yourself and that's what keeps us going. Because if we didn't tell on ourselves and we didn't continue to take inventory and point out those character defects, we would not continue to grow in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And one other thing that I want to say about six and seven is that when I am doing a fist step with a sponsee, I have no problems telling them what their character defects are. So if you're sponsoring and they don't see it, just tell them. <laughs> and they would, if they knew, they would put it down. So because I'm grateful that a sponsor looked at me and said, Polly, you are a child abuser, and was willing to tell me the truth to absolutely give me the truth, whether I wanted to hear it or not. And those are the gifts that I've been continually given in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And today, today, I've got two character defects that I shared with you that happened that I have become well aware of coming to Australia. And I'm so grateful. I'm going to thank God for those character defects because what happened is it just got me a little more in the book. And it just shows me at 39 years of sobriety, I got a lot to learn. God bless you.